Hey, so I'd like to present Vero GPU. Uh, so what is Vero GPU? Vero GPU is work to create an open source GPU ASIC. So we're explicitly targeting ASIC, not FPGA. We want it to be fast. It's only for machine learning and we want to primarily use open source tooling. Uh, so what are some of the motivations or end games for this? Like, taping out an ASIC is very expensive, like millions of dollars. I'm not going to pay for that. So how to handle that. So what I'm imagining in my head is that if, if someone wants to today create a, a startup that distributes, creates, manufactures a GPU, they have to design that GPU and verify that GPU. And that's a significant barrier to entry. It's a significant hurdle that they have to overcome. Now, if we can create an open source GPU that's fully verified, that people know, okay, if I can get the money to take this out, it's going to work. That's, that significantly reduces the barrier to entry to creating a startup that creates a GPU. So then there's like two possible ways forward I see. So one is like someone creates a startup, gets VC, tapes it out and distributes it. And then another is like a large company like say Facebook uh, could tape it out and distribute it. Why might Facebook do that? Well, that, that creates an alternative to like Google's TPU, for example, maybe. Some design decisions. We're explicitly targeting FPGA. So in the past, I had some OpenCL projects where I would develop the projects on NVIDIA GPUs. And they worked pretty well on NVIDIA GPUs. But when I tried them on, a, on AMD GPUs, because I'd spent all my time optimizing for NVIDIA, they ran pretty slowly on the AMD. So what I want to avoid is if I target FPGAs or I test on FPGAs, I will naturally over time optimize for FPGAs. There are things you can do on FPGAs that you can't do on ASICs and vice versa. If I'm targeting FPGAs, I won't be using the full capabilities of the ASIC and I will naturally be optimizing for F FPGA. So I'm just not going to do FPGAs at all, like only ASIC and, and simulation. Uh, first, machine learning. Right now, because we're targeting machine learning, that means there's some optimizations that we can do. So recently, there is a type of float called BrainFloat16, BF16. This is becoming quite popular in large models like transformers, very large language models. It has the same dynamic range as FP32, but it uses fewer bits. And so the calculations, everything, space, memory transfer, everything goes faster. So I want to only, only target BF16. No FP16, no FP32, no FP64. So for example, NVIDIA GPUs, they're going, they have to do like all of these. They have to do BF16, FP16, FP32, FP64. And that uses a lot of extra die space and it reduces the yield. All right? So by only doing BF16, we, we save die space, we increase the yield. Similarly, for the FP operators, there are some operators that are needed by machine learning, specifically logarithms, exponential, possibly Tanha. Uh, but there's a, a lot of other operators that we don't need for machine learning, for running transformers and so on. So we can just not implement those. That saves more data space and increases the yield. Right, and then I wanted to work with PyTorch. So there are a number of deep learning frameworks out there. So TensorFlow is one, PyTorch is another, and there are others. I'm choosing PyTorch. I've used PyTorch a lot, I'm very familiar with it. It's used extensively in both industry and in research. So yeah, this is my choice. That doesn't mean that we couldn't also get very GP working on TensorFlow. I'm just only targeting PyTorch. Um, and we wanted to use primarily open source tooling. All right, so here is like the end-to-end -end planned architecture. This screen is split into two halves. So on the left-hand side over here, we've got like the main board, the PC, the, the main host computer. And the right-hand side, we've got the GPU card. And the GPU card comprises like We've got DDR global memory on the card, and then we've got the GPU die itself, which is the ASIC that we're taping out. Uh, so on the left, we've got PyTorch. That communicates using a PIP, HIP API with our host side runtime. And then that host side runtime is going to handle things like virtual memory, transferring data to and from the GPU from the main memory, um, and like launching kernels. That's going to communicate through PCIe to the GPU controller that sits on the die. The GPU controller is going to similarly handle like virtual memory, uh, starting and stopping uh, kernels and so on. Uh, we've also got a compute unit which contains multiple GPU cores. Uh, we've got DDR controller and then we've got DDR global memory that sits on the card, not on the die. Um, and then some shared memory. There's also some RISC-free kernels. All right, so PyTorch, when you can compile, when you compile PyTorch, it's going to compile the GPU kernels at the time of compilation. So these could be 
CUDA kernels compiled into like the CUDA ISA. It could be um, AMD HIP kernels compiled into the HIP ISA. We are using RISC-V, so we need the GPU kernels to be compiled into a RISC-V. All right, so of this architecture, what exists now and uh, what is to do? In blue, we've got the things that exist now, and in yellow are the things that we need to do. So we've got the host side runtime, so that exists. We can already run C++ programs with GPU kernels in. Those GPU kernels will be transferred to what I'm running in simulation, right? To the simulated GPU, and will then run in the simulated GPU core. Uh, we've got a GPU controller, which handles the other side of the communication, sits on the die. Uh, we've got a GPU core, which handles like basic arithmetic, int and FB. Currently FB32, we need to migrate that to FB16. We don't have the PCI interface or the DDR controller, and currently we haven't compiled these RISC-V kernels for PyTorch. Uh, okay, right, so then some design decisions. So there are other design decisions, but these are the decision, design decisions that I found felt that the answers were less least clear to me. So I had to think about these more than many other design decisions. Uh, so we've got how to work with PyTorch. Uh, well, actually, ISA choice and design is relatively straightforward with some nuance. Uh, how to handle the DDR memory and the PCI link, and do we need network on a chip? All right, so how to make it work with PyTorch, right? So there's a few options here. So one is to integrate directly with PyTorch. So we couple it directly into PyTorch. We modify PyTorch to call directly into our very GPU code. The issue with this is lots of development would, would be needed and PyTorch will push back because we're not using a standard interface. A fairly tempting on the surface option is to use OpenCL. Why, why does it appear tempting? Well, because it's an open standard. However, we would still need lots of development because PyTorch doesn't yet work with OpenCL. Now, there is a lone developer working on migrating PyTorch to work with OpenCL. That work is in development. Now, even if they succeeded, a challenge, a fundamental limitation with OpenCL is that OpenCL needs to work across many platforms and many vendors. That means whenever any functionality is implemented, it involves discussion with like 15, 17 vendors around a table and they all have little things that they want to do and change. So the result is the standard has to handle all of these different vendors and requirements, which makes it quite complicated and it's hard to implement OpenCL quickly. Whereas, for example, CUDA only, is relatively simple, only has to target a single vendor so they can optimize that highly, just implement the minimum things to do what they need to do without having to handle other vendors' requirements. All right, so CUDA. CUDA is tempting because it already works with PyTorch. It's kind of de a de facto standard for machine learning GPUs. I would say the main challenge here is how to defend against uh, cease and desist from NVIDIA, right? Because it's their IP. And another challenge which sort of goes hand in hand with this is I don't like to, I, I avoid, if I'm working on anything where I'm doing like open source using CUDA, like I have a project, I have an open source project called Coriander where I take CUDA kernels and then I compile them into OpenCL. Now, this sort of works. A challenge I found was that I didn't feel that I had the right to read the CUDA API docs. So the only way I could learn about the CUDA API was by reading other programs that used CUDA and therefore by, for compatibility purposes, I feel that I have a fair use to look at how they're using the API, but obviously this is very convoluted and quite hard. So, right, so I'm avoiding CUDA here. I mean, I nearly chose CUDA, but like AMD HIP. So AMD HIP is basically CUDA API, but all the words CUDA replaced by like HIP in all of the API calls. So it's basically the similar API, but just with slightly different names. It's open source under an MIT license. It's already supported by PyTorch. It's very similar to CUDA. I feel that there's not much risk of being sent to cease and desist by NVIDIA. If they were going to do that, they would already do that to AMD. Even if NVIDIA did that to me, I feel that AMD might help pay for my defense. Because if I had to retract mine, then that would be evidence that AMD would have to retract theirs. All right, so I'm choosing AMD HIP. 
uh, it's sort of a compromise decision, but I feel like it's open source. It's, it's already sort of supported by PyTorch, and there's little IP litigation risk, a relatively small IP litigation risk, I feel. All right, I said choice in design. So using risk, risk B, this is very popular recently. Many projects are using it. It's very nice to use. I'm, I'm enjoying using it. I'm using the ZFINX extension so that we unify the float and the integer register file. We might need to break with VSCV in order to migrate to the Blame Float 16. Now, there might be an extension already for Blame Float 16. If there is, that's good. I want to know about that. Uh, I haven't found one yet, although I haven't searched incredibly hard, I have to say. But yeah, if you know of an extension. Otherwise, I might have to create my own extension, maybe potentially. But I will probably have to, therefore, modify the like LLVM and all of these things in order to handle the extent. All right, how to handle DDR memory and PCIe link. Right, so I don't want the DDR controller and the PCI interface to be in very GPU. I feel that these are standard components and I feel that the appropriate way to handle these is to just drop in some third-party IP. So whoever tapes the GPU out, they can get hold of a third-party IP controller for DDR and an interface for PCA and just drop those into the design. I feel that um, getting hold of a GPU, that's kind of challenging. Getting hold of a GPU design that's verified, etc., that's kind of challenging. But getting hold of a DDR controller, PCA interface, I feel there should be some out there um, and they can just be dropped into the design. I don't see any point in, in like bundling those in with the very GPU, so keep those factorized out. As far as how to talk with those, so I'm going to use Axie 4 because this is a fairly standard interface in industry. Uh, however, it seems like Axie 4 is not sufficient to fully specify the interface as far as I can tell. So there's probably still going to be some controller specific integration somehow. Uh, if anyone knows like a standard way of interfacing with DDR memory controller and PCI interface, I, I would be very interested to know that. As far as I know, there will be some controller-specific integration. Uh, do we need a network on a chip? So I'm reliably informed that yes, we do. However, I'm not sure about this. Like, I feel that the GPU is sufficiently hierarchical that maybe we don't need a network on a chip. Right? Like all of the cores, they sit in a compute unit. So the cores communicate with the compute unit, communi compute unit communicates with units above that. So I'm not sure that we need the network on a chip. I'm not sure. I'll see. I'll find out. So what's working? So single source compilation works. So you can write some C++ that contains a GPU kernel. You can compile that. That kernel can then be run on the simulated GPU. This all works today. Um, the compilation is using Clang LLVM to split out the GPU kernel from the host-side code and then compile that kernel into RISC-V. We need to provide a runtime library, and I'm providing a, a, a HIP-compatible runtime library. The HIP runtime library handles things like virtual memory allocation for the GPU, uh, transferring data to and from the GPU, transferring the kernel to the GPU, and launching the kernel. So this exists today. This works today. A basic GPU core. So we've got a basic GPU core. It's using the RISC-V ISA. It's got Intel FB32 arithmetic. It's got a relatively fast propagation delay, I feel. Uh, things that, um, <clears throat> that we need to add in are uh, instruction parallelism, we currently don't, ha don't have. Uh, caching, we need to add in caching. Currently it's using FP32, we need to migrate to the brain float 16. And there's some floating point operations we need to add, specifically exponential, logarithm, and tan tanher, maybe a couple of others. Things we don't need or want, we don't want super scalar execution because this uses absolutely tons of dice bits. This is great because then we don't have to implement super scalar execution. So we don't need to do out of order or, any, or micro operations or any of these things. Right? That's gone. So it's relatively simple. We want the GPU core to be relatively simple because then it takes up a small amount of put die area. We're going to have thousands of these on the GPU die. So they all have to be relatively small and simple. So this makes our life easier. Uh, GPU controller. So the GPU, GPU controller sits on the GPU die and that communicates with the host side run side library, runtime library. Um, it handles copying data between the GPU global memory and host side memory in either direction, um, sending kernels to the GPU compute unit and launching them. So that's working today. PyTorch to do. So PyTorch is compiled for AMD. Well, it's compiled for CUDA and you can also compile it for AMD here. 
when it's compiled for AMD HIP, the kernels are compiled into the AMD ISA. So those won't run on our GPU because we leave them compiled into the RISC-V ISA. Now, more or less, what we just need to do is to recompile PyTorch using our own <coughs> runtime and libraries. However, we need to create those libraries so that when we compile PyTorch, it will compile into RISC-V. This needs a bit of tweaking and hacking around. I've done something similar because in my project where I took CUDA kernels and compiled those into OpenCL, it's kind of similar, actually harder, so this is easier than that. It's doable, but it will need a certain amount of time. It's not just like an hour of like typing dot flash configure or something like that. There will actually need to be some modifications in head files and definitions created and, and modified and so on in order to do this. But it's doable. All right, so verification. So if we want people to take this out, spend millions of dollars on it, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars, we need to show that it's going to work. Right? It's not enough just to write some code and say, well, I guess it works. We need to prove or make it very certain that if it's taped out, it's actually going to run. Um, in industry, 80% of development effort slash money slash time goes into verification, not into writing the code. I'm creating unit tests as I go along. They all run currently in Icarus Verilog, um, and then some, are, some of these have been ported to Verilator. I'm sort of porting more and more as I go. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I've faced so far is uninitialized X values. These are quite hard to detect, I find. Uh, one way to detect them is to use gate level simulation with iVerilog. This catches quite a few, but not all. Uh, I also experiment with using like asserts with iVerilog. That, also catches some, but again, not all. There's many edge cases and corner cases. What I'm finding works quite reliably is random initialization with Verilator. So Verilator can, whenever there's some new wire created, it, it, you can tell it, all right, just initialize it with a random value. So sometimes it'll be zero, sometimes it'll be one. If you run it enough times with the random initialization, a failure to initialize will manifest in a fail, failing unit. These failures can be hard to track down, but at least we know there's a bug to fix. I feel it's vastly preferable to know there's a bug somewhere and to have to spend some time tracking that down compared to not knowing there's a bug at all. And if we run the test many times and we don't manifest any bugs, then we can be reasonably confident that the initializations are working okay. Not entirely 100% because there's a sort of like probabilistic element here, but I feel that it works fairly well. All right, so unit test, random initialization. Uh, all right, performance. So there's three measures of performance that we care about. One is propagation delay, one is die area, and one is cycle count. So propagation delay is the time for the, at each clock cycle, um, any changes in flip-flops inputs has to propagate through our combinatorial logic, and that takes a certain amount of time, which is the propagation delay. The propagation delay uh, controls how fast we can set our clock speed. So the the faster the propagation delay, the higher the clock speed we can use and the faster we can run our GPU. The cycle count is the number of cycles to run a particular instruction. So the cycle count combined with the propagation delay basically decides how fast our GPU is going to run. And then die area factors factorizes into cost. Like the, the more die area, the higher the cost of taping out and the lower the yield. So the smaller the die area, yield goes up, cost of taping out goes down. So overall cost goes down. For the propagation delay and the die area, so I believe that you can use like OpenStar slash timer to do this. However, I wasn't able to figure out how to get that working. I sort of tried a bit, I didn't figure out. What I'm doing is I'm using YoSys to synthesize down to a gate level netlist. I'm not doing layout here. I'm using the structure of the logic gates, like the network of logic gates as a proxy for how much, time, how much time will be in the propagation delay and, and the diary. But this doesn't take into account things like wire lengths and layout. So it's just a proxy. To actually get the actual exact propagation delay and diary, I would need to run layout, which I'm currently not doing, but will obviously do in the future. So I'm using Yosys to synthesize down to a gate level analyst. I'm using an open source 90 nanometer cell library called SAD. EDK90 to do this. This is provided by Synopsis, which is very nice of them. But yeah, it's open source, it's, it's not IP encumbered, so we can freely use that. 
and then what I'm doing is I'm, well, I have a custom script that walks the netlist. And what I'm doing is I'm calculating propagation delay in units of NAND gate propagation delay. All right, so what is NAND gate propagation delay? It's the propagation delay of a single NAND gate. So if we have one NAND gate, then the NAND gate propagation delay is one. If we have two NAND gates, one after the other, then it's two. If we had a NAND gate followed by a NOT gate, so a NOT gate propagation delay is about 0 0.6 times a NAND gate propagation delay. So a NAND followed by a NOT is about 1.6 NAND gate propagation delay. And this should be fairly node technology independent, like whether we're using five nanometer or 90 nanometer, a NOT gate is about 0 0.6 the propagation delay of a NAND gate. Not exactly, but approximately ballpark. So basically my calculation of like NAND gate propagation delay is I feel, it, feel a fairly reasonable proxy to be able to judge, okay, this implementation is faster than this. I don't know the exact propagation delay and depending on layout, that like actually the relative rankings might not be quite the same, but hopefully it's a reasonable proxy to be able to choose a faster circuit over a slower circuit. And similarly, for the die area, I calculate in terms of NAND gate die area. So if we've got two NAND gates, that's two NAND gate die area. So again, we're not doing layout, we're not taking into account wires, and we're not taking into account like power lines. Okay, but I feel it might be a reasonable proxy uh, in order to get some indication of propagation delay and die area. And then cycle count is easy to measure, it's just the number of clock cycles for particular test programs. So we run a test program like say matrix multiplication and how many clock cycles does that take? All right, so this is performance. Uh, so all of these like tests run on a CI server using Circle CI, which is free for open source projects. Basically every commit, it runs the, it calculates the, measures the propagation delay, the die area, and the cycle count as run, well as running the unit tests for the verification. Uh, we actually have like integration tests and stuff too. Uh, all right, what open source tooling am I using? So I'm using Icarus Verilog, which is a simulator, Verilator, which is another simulator, and Yosis, which is a synthesizer. So what are the good and bad points about these? So Icarus Verilog is, is very easy to use. Uh, it generates compiles code very quickly and you can write test cases in Verilog, which is super nice. Bad points is it has limited support for system Verilog. So I, I feel that it was written a while ago and it hasn't been updated much for system Verilog. It's got a strict GPL v2 license. Now, this is not an issue if we're only using Verilog. However, I want to be running simulations from PyTorch from C++, which means I need to link my C++ code or the PyTorch code to the iVerilog library. If we need to link those together and the library is GPLv2, that means my code needs to be GPLv2 too. I want my code to be under a more open license of MIT, so I want to avoid linking with the GPLv2 iVerilog library. Um, it's also unclear to me how to guarantee detection of initialization errors when we're using iVerilog. Now moving on to Verilator. Good points of Verilator. It's got a really great reputation in industry. It runs quickly. Now, when I say it runs quickly, it compiles and generates relatively slowly, but once it's compiled and generated, it runs quickly. It's got a relatively unrestricted license, the lesser GPLv2. So we can freely link to LGPLv2 code without our code needing itself to be LGPLv2. So this is great for VPI uh, linking with C++. I find that it detects initialization errors reliably using the random initialization. It's easy to link with C++, which is great for when we're running like PyTorch against our simulated GPU, and system Verilog support is underway. Bad points, so the system Verilog support is still in progress. Uh, compilation generation is fairly slow, and it's hard to configure. Like You have to set up some files, a whole bunch of code in order to run anything at all compared to iVerilog where you can just run it on the command and it's super easy. Um, and you can't create standard Verilog test bench unit tests. Now you can kind of tweak, hack around your Verilog so that most of your testing IP is in Verilog and then the C++ is just a very thin shell on top of that. However, you end up with the, the resulting Verilog code is not as intuitive to understand and to read and to maintain as if the whole thing is written in Verilog. That said, because of the advantages of Verilator, the relatively unrestricted license, 
and to the detection of the initialization errors, I'm gradually moving my tests into Verilator and moving into Verilator. And then uh, Yosis is the synthesizer. So Yosis is really amazing synthesizer. Like, it's awesome. I haven't discovered a bug in it yet. Right? Sometimes I find a bug and I'm like, oh, I finally found, I found a bug in Yosis, but it's always a bug in my own code. It's always something I've done wrong in my own code. So yeah, Yosis just works really well. It's very reliable. Uh, it can handle a very diverse space of Verilog code. It doesn't handle system Verilog, so you have to feed it Verilog. But if you feed it Verilog, it can handle a diverse space of Verilog. Um, if it can't handle something, it will say, it will say, oh, I can't handle that. It won't just give you the wrong answer. So either it will give you the right answer, which is the vast majority of the time, or it will say, oh, I can't handle that input, you need to change something. And it will tell you approximately what you need to change. Bad points, as for all of these tools, uh, limited support for system Verilog. Right now, there's some tooling I tried, but I haven't used yet. So one is OpenStar Timer, uh, one is SVTV, and one is Qflow. So OpenStar Timer, like as far as I know, it can be used to measure the propagation delay. It might also handle layout, I'm not sure. Anyway, I couldn't like get it to work. Maybe I'm using it wrongly, but it, I couldn't get it to work for myself. So yeah, so I'm not using that currently, but maybe in the future. SV2V, so SV2V is a very nice uh, project. It takes system Verilog, and it converts it into Verilog. So then we can then feed that Verilog into all these other tools that only support Verilog. So the good point is it works with system Verilog. Bad point is when something goes wrong, it dumps you into the generated Verilog. So when I have an error, I get dumped into generated code that I didn't write. So I have two sets of code, the system Verilog that I wrote and know intimately and understand very well. And then whenever I get an error, I get dumped into code that I didn't write and that's generated, which is quite challenging. I sort of tried that for a while, but personally, currently, I find it more effort to deal with the dual code than to simply write everything in Verilog, keep everything in Verilog, the sort of lowest common denominator across all the tools I'm using. But I do like the idea of SVTV. I feel it would be nice if, uh, it would be really nice if SV2V could do what it does and then somehow dump you into the system Verilog when there's an error, along with the system Verilog related error, rather than dumping into the generated Verilog, maybe. Uh, Qflow, so Qflow is a, is a layout software. As far as I know, it's the only open source layout tool, uh, although it may be OpenStar Timer handles layout too, I'm not sure. Uh, bad points, I couldn't, I found it hard to use. I tried it with like a very simple example, like one NAND get or something like that, and I, and I couldn't get it to work. So I'm probably just using it wrongly, but yeah, like I, I, I'm not using it currently. I will probably use it in the future and figure out how to use it because basically as far as I know, it, it's the only open source layout at all. So gaps and opportunities for open source. So system bear log support. So I need a DDR5.6 controller and a PCI interface. A BMEM block generator, so as far as I know, all BMEM block generators are all provided by the foundry. Now I'm wondering if there's a way that if we could have like an open source BMEM block generator, which is somehow foundry independent. Now, I don't know if this is possible, but like we have like these languages that support creating like logic gates that become like logic cells, which then get changed into the foundry stuff. Uh, I wonder if we can do something similar for BMAN block generator. I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. And an easy to run chip layout generator. All right, so system Verilog support, this could be adding support to existing tools. It could be uh, tweaking SV2V so that the workflow stays within the system Verilog code. DDR5 and 6 controller. Uh, so ideally with a full verification suite. So when someone tapes out the chip, they don't want to just take a, a DDR controller that has just been developed a bit, and there's no guarantee that that's going to work, because the 80% of development effort for ASICs is on verification. So if they have to write the verification themselves, they, that's 80% of the development. So that's a significant burden and a significant obstacle. So it does need to have a full verification suite. We want to have a standard interface as possible, e.g. using Axie 4, and ideally, we should have some, some kind of proxy module for running simulations, right? We would, shouldn't have to run the full DDR controller PCI interface when we're just running simulations. We should be able to bypass that for simulations, at least for when we're simulating the whole end-to-end like, -end system. 
uh, beam amplock generator, is this possible in open source? I don't know, but like, I'm just kind of throwing that out there, like, is there a way to do this? Uh, easy to run chip layout generator. So this might be as simple as adding documentation to Qflow, um, but I think there might be a need for some, some test cases though, uh, because like, I mean, I, I hit issues very quickly and easily, but I might be just using it wrongly. All right, so thank you for listening. Very GPU aims to be an open source GPU ASIC dedicated to machine learning. It's got an extensive verification suite, like unit tests, integration tests, etc. We're calculating performance metrics for die area, propagation delay, and cycle count, and it's dedicated to machine learning. So we intend to use only BrainFloat 16 in order to keep the die area low and the yield high. We intend to implement only floating point operations needed by ML, and we intend to ensure that it works with PyTorch. Cool. Thank you for listening.